Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. Today's video is regarding Andrew Tate, DEI, and misogyny. And we will proceed in reverse order, starting off with misogyny. So probably people have heard in recent times that it's now become like an act of terrorism, extreme misogyny. So I thought we might as well break down what it actually means and how it's misapplied to, well, for example, Islam, but certainly the more traditional and conservative folk and therefore misrepresenting those people as well unfairly. And this is a common tactic that has to be used because of the weak justifications and foundations of the people who kind of sit on the other side of the conversation. So let's, let's go into it. So as far as I'm aware, I'd like I say any benefit from this video comes from Almighty God and all mistakes and errors are my own. So if I do make mistakes and I do apologize, and that is part of this channel, is to learn and grow and put my hands up when I'm wrong and say, look, is that not life? We, we you know, we evolve as we gain more knowledge and experience. If the wind is affecting the sound quality, then I can only apologize for that. I do have, inshallah, brand new microphones on the horizon, which I should be able to clip here and increase the sound quality. Alas, I digress. Misogyny, the root of the word, etymologically, that is to say that the history of the word and its meaning is misogyny can be broken down into the, the miso and the juni. It basically means a, a hatred of women, which, wow, wow. So, you know, that accusation is, is very strong, isn't it? When, certainly when one has, you know, mothers, sisters, wives, daughters, and the like, what an accusation. So what, what does it mean? to hate, to have contempt, indignation, or even prejudice. I mean, that's another word that's sometimes used, prejudice against women. Well, what does prejudice mean? I believe prejudice is a preconceived and unreasonable opinion that one has created based on some kind of experience or knowledge. So that's what we need to delve into because therefore when one makes a statement based on their own experience or based on their own reasoning, reason is how one can explain something, how one can justify something using certain methodology, for example, logic, for example, experience. And so it's crazy because when we look at, generally speaking, humans and society, we're a team, males and females, men and women, it is together that we create the family, it is together that we build a society. And if you say that, for example, generally speaking, on the macro level, males and females play different roles, men and women can be more beneficial, it can be more advantageous for them to play certain roles in society. This is not hating. This is not being unjust. This is just stating simple fact. So it's, it's quite confusing. Uh, prejudice equally, like I say, it's prejudice is like you, a form of perhaps discrimination based on background. So if one, you know, happens to be, for example, a male, and I mean, look, is it prejudice? Is it misogynistic to say that, by and large, 
men are superior in strength to women. I don't know. I, I think maybe. I don't, I don't know. That's the current kind of... And the, the strange thing is when it comes to prejudice, when it comes to misogyny, we have to go down to the roots of what it means how someone is able to, you know, how, to what degree is one a logician? To what degree is one able to use reason? Because if they think that, if they've bought into this new narrative of, you know, men and women are completely equal in all aspects of life and nothing really separates us, then obviously they're going to be far easier to trigger when somebody makes obvious statements based on reality, biology, and, and experience. So that was the first thing I thought, because obviously certainly when we're now talking about the latter two points of DEI, that is meaning, diversity, equality, and inclusion. And of course, the infamous public figure of Andrew Tate Misogyny is certainly something that needs to be spoken about. Now, what is worth saying is that when we do look at the history of civilization and humanity, I do agree and certainly would purport that women have not exactly had the easiest time. And that in this dynamic, this sociological dynamic, the family dynamic that is supposed to be there for all's benefit, there certainly has been a trepid that's the right word, a ghastly and unbecoming past. And so therefore there is a trauma there that needs to be recognised and accepted. But also equally we need to move on from it. And so we'll move on to DEI now, which I've only recently come across. I've seen there's been a bit of a surge online, people speaking about it. So let's get into it. Diversity. Of course, diversity is a great thing, but this is the big problem. When I hear diversity, I think diversity of philosophy, diversity of opinion, diversity of belief. I don't think diversity of things that I think are effectively arbitrary, but yet are being focused on. Diversity of sexual orientation diversity of skin colour, diversity of nationality, diversity of these type things. These things are less important because what you can have is you can have a white man, a green man, a yellow man, a black man, a brown man and a grey man. But if they all think the exact same thing, then the diversity is an external illusory identity rather than what really matters. So I think diversity, diversity is great. My own son is biracial, mixed race. My own son has a mixture of Caucasian and African heritage. You know, his, the, the blood running through his veins is one of diversity. You know, he's not married to his, you know, Caucasian sister. He's married. Uh, sorry, I'm not married to my Caucasian sister. I am married to an African sister and therefore the blood running through my son's veins is incredibly diverse. So I'm all about diversity. I'm all about, you know, sharing conversations. But this is the thing when it comes to diversity. It seems as though we can't have diverse opinion because people then start to get all crybaby trigger city and they don't like the fact that, as I've spoken about in past videos, obviously I am purporting a certain lifestyle. And in doing that, other lifestyles fall to the wayside. Other lifestyles, in my worldview, are inferior. Now, the problem with the word superior and inferior is that, again, because of our traumatic history of so much exploitation, war and totalitarian regimes, just look at the 20th century, the amount of bloodshed, that people then immediately, they, they're, that we're gunning for this kind of uber fair on the surface society when people don't realize that we live in a the natural law is one of hierarchy this is what i was speaking last night to well it was the night before last to with my own mother is that the madness of these recent riots and such is that they have the basically the white english working class people 
fighting against the Asian or African heritage working class people, forgetting that there's people worth hundreds of millions and billions. Look, try and find the land register. Try and find the people that own the land. The money is tied up in literally just, you know, a mere percentage of the entire population. And yet they have the poor people who can't rub two pennies together. Effectively, they're in debt. They're struggling to pay their bills. They're effectively economic slaves built into a system that forces them to not live a life of creativity and freedom, but really of, like I say, kind of matrix slavery in the sense that, you know, they have to go to work because they need to pay their bills. They need to pay their rent on and on and on. There's enough money for everybody, <laughs> but yet that's not how it works. So my point is that on the surface, people want a workforce where you have all different orientations, backgrounds, preferences, but yet it's like, it's like now you have a diverse workforce of slaves rather than just a single group of slaves. And so it's, it's a crazy world that we live in diversity of belief is the most important thing without people becoming like like I say trigger city on the situation so diversity inclusion yeah I'm all about inclusion I like these words diversity love it but take it with a pinch of salt you know inclusion alhamdulillah include people yeah you know like I haven't got an issue with that I do think that the whole positive discrimination thing you got to be a little bit careful with that. I like the sentiment. I like the sentiment of a lot of these things. But at the same time, I say err on the side of caution, diversity, inclusion and equality. And this, I think, is the big one that can be spoken about when it comes to equality. You know, when it comes to, for example, LGBT, when it comes to, you know, feminist movements, when it comes to kind of minority groups who are still fighting for equality it's like do they not already have equality guys come on come on i don't know maybe i'm wrong are lg are not workforces anti-racist are not workforces lgbt pro are workforces completely pro-feminism like the workforce i'm in there's people of different sexual orientations there's men and women there's white people, black people, Asian people. It's like everybody's there. So what more do, they, do, do people want? It's not now that people can rent houses and buy houses and get jobs, go to university. There is now that positive discrimination that's allowing people to access all the things that admittedly they struggled to access 50 years ago or 100 years ago, certainly. But now I'm struggling to see what what the next step is the next step seems to be when you know you take a good thing too far and something that has genuine roots in rights and equality now starts to become a bit fascist and a bit my side versus your side and you have to accept that for example we we'll use those couple examples there you have to accept that men and women are equal in all domains when that just to me sounds so ridiculous and bizarre not to oppress women but to actually revitalize or to fully appreciate and respect look the thing is you have to how can you respect differences if you don't even accept them it's this it's this illusion that we're we're the same so look at the end of the day Lakum deen, lakum deen, my favorite verse in the Quran. People can do whatever they want to do. But again, when it comes to sexual orientation, like I said before many times, I think it's bizarre that people like identify as what they like to do in the bedroom and bring that into the public domain. They bring that into the workforce. Allah knows best. The world we live in. I. The, th the thing is, I guess it's a tough one, isn't it? Because when somebody is self-proclaimed kind of conservative or traditional folk fella or lass but then you look at okay when times were traditional and conservative there was also a lot of problems so i'm not saying that to go back to the 60s 
would solve everything. There's a lot of problems in the 60s. There's also a lot of problems in the 20s now, the 2020s. So anyway, I thought that misogyny and this DEI, diversity, rather D-I-E, or is it D-E-I? It's D-E-I, diversity, equality, and inclusion, forgive me, that these two things would be a perfect segue into talking about the much hated, but also much beloved Marmite figure of Andrew Tate. And I've listened to a couple of his podcasts recently, one with Candice Owens and one with a therapist. I haven't finished that one. I listened to maybe 25 minutes last night. And I just wanted to kind of open a conversation because even my brother, when I was ice barreling with him yesterday, was saying that, you know, basically I don't really like his vibe. He's spoken out kind of, quote unquote, against women. You know, he's got political, he's kind of shot himself in the foot. And when we talk, you know, my brother's spoken about sort of a more of a reserved, peaceful lifestyle where, you know, make your money and have your influence, but also not become this huge kind of controversial figure. And, you know, I completely understand that, but I'm guessing what he's done is obviously he had you know, the good life, multi-millions and looking after his family and all this kind of stuff. But obviously there's something inside him that you know, it often talks about the matrix, the Neo inside him is saying, well, I've got that now, but I don't want to hide in the shadows. I don't want to remain silent. I want to speak out against things that I see are certainly polemics, but issues, controversial issues in society that I sit on, you know, a certain side of. And obviously he thinks that's the right side. And he doesn't speak, as I was listening to last night with his talk with a therapist, he doesn't speak controversially for the sake of it. So that he's just speaking his mind. And something that I can dive into straight now based on that is the fact that people don't speak their mind, the fact that people's opinions, people's perceptions, they've been shaped by their loved ones, by their families, by their colleagues, by their friends, by their upbringings, by their education. And so even if they want to speak out, even if they have a slightly different opinion, the group think and societal pressure, the peer pressure of, of, of the group as a whole is incredibly strong. And you can look at so many obvious experiments for that. The two that come to mind is, you know, you have one person there who is like a legit random kind of person who has no idea it's an experiment. Then you've got 14 other people who are like plants and you, you know, in like a waiting room and the beep goes off, beep, every two minutes, everybody stands up. Doesn't take too many beeps before the 15th person also stands up. Same thing, 14 people get shown a piece of paper with a circle on it and they all say, what is this? They all say square. The last person who's not the plant sees that it's clearly a circle and yet they say square too. So whether it's self-preservation, whether it's different people have, per, per, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Presentity, that's not the right word. Certain people are, a, a pre, ah, when I watch this uh, video back, I'm going to a pretensity, a pretensity. I'm trying to get right to the right word. Basically people are inclined more than others to either be rebellious or, you know, conform. So we all have different makeups, but, my point is that people generally play it safe. People generally remain strapped into the accepted ideology of society. I mean, and we all think that we are special, you know, we kind of all got egos and that, but forgive me if the wind is being a, a pain, but we all know when societies develop, you know, whether it's, for example, Nazi Germany, the vast majority of people just went along with it. Simple as that. And so it's the same thing now with this DEI. People are just going along with it and also to their own detriment because now how many bloodlines will continue? What I 
like about Andrew Tate, and there's many things that I don't like about him, certainly. But also, I think that there is a certain amount of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like, just because somebody says something, or even a handful of things, or even half of what they say, doesn't align to you, or you don't like, it seems rather bizarre to me to then just completely disregard everything else that they're saying, even if there is validity and reason to it. So that's something I see that's quite common. It's like, oh, well, he said this thing. It's like, well, look, nobody's perfect. So maybe you should kind of take it with a pinch of salt and see what you can learn from somebody who clearly is incredibly wealthy. Now, some people say money is the root of all evil. I don't want anything to do with mega wealth. I'm quite happy being a wagey or a slave as uh, the kind of the Tate lexicon would say and that's fine but also you know not just financially physically somebody who is a world champion at a sport somebody who's physically disciplined who's fit and healthy strong and upright another thing that we can look at somebody who doesn't d indulge in drugs and alcohol somebody who you know there's there's qualities that we can look at everybody i mean a great example would be the royal family you know, you have the anti-royalists, people who, you know, just, it's almost like, it's just like such a whiny, complaining mentality. What I see in the royals, the couple of things that come to mind, is a life of dedication that they can't really opt out of. Certainly, you know, the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the direct heirs to the throne. It's one thing if you're the spare kind of have the choice to, to jump ship but obviously if you're about if you're going to be the king you can't really sidestep that and so although it's a great privilege it's also an incredible burden so i look at how they handle a huge burden and you can look for that for motivation the fact that they are incredible public speakers when many of us will poop our pants in a public situation where we've got to stand up and be the center of attention our heart starts beating our pores start sweating and you think wow these these people you know are very good at public speaking they are also very good at you know academia speaking multiple languages playing musical instruments having knowledge on history and the environment what whatever it is there's things in people that you can disagree with their ideology, you can disagree with what they represent, but you can choose to see beneficial things that, you know, can inspire you. So it's almost like the Islamic tradition has a sense of always look for the good in people and always give people the benefit of the doubt. It's not somebody's fault if they're born into status or wealth. Just because you haven't doesn't mean that through resentment and kind of subdued anger with your own situation. You should like hate on other people. So I think there's a big part of that, for example, with Andrew Tate. People, and I don't play, I don't purport this or condone this, but certainly, you know, talking about women being what could be perceived as arrogant, you know, like I can have any woman I want. A lot of people are not gonna vibe with that, certainly. and. But at the same time, if that's his genuine situation and he's just sharing himself, most people don't share themselves because they're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of what their partner will think, what their parents will think. And once you are able to elevate above that, then you are free to a certain degree. So there's a lot of stuff that he talks about that I think there's value to. I cannot lie about that. And I find, what I find so interesting is what a polarizing figure he is and the polarity of the character highlights to me the position somebody is at. Because if somebody is so triggered by him, I'm thinking, yeah, he says some things that are not great, but at the same time, is he not? And wow, I did not expect the wind to be so strong. <laughs> um, a little walk before lunch, breathe in the countryside air, well, alhamdulillah. My point is that I don't see 
a misogynist. I see, in many ways, a realist. I see somebody who has come from nothing, you know, council, estate, life, single parent upbringing, and has worked hard to, and maybe cut some corners and maybe done some something that's unethical, that's, you know, certainly up for debate. But how much have we all done? This is what I always think, the old thing of pointing one thing, you got three pointing back. How much have we done as individuals that's unethical? Have we participated in drug and party culture? And when you buy bags of class A drugs and you go to raves and sniff drugs, do you think you're complete, your hands are completely free from the process, how that drug has entered your system? Absolutely not. That drug is a part of a larger illegal black market system that incorporates trafficking and prostitution and violence and gangs and the like. And so it's almost like we all think we're angels, but there's some kind of like cathartic ostracization, ostracization of this big public figure that we can all throw the tomato, you know, the person getting stoned, we can all go and stone the person who's publicly being berated. But as Jesus Christ, the Lady Salam says, I believe in the Bible, and I don't know its legitimacy historically, but you know, may he who is free of sin cast the first stone. It's like, I just find it so interesting that people, you know, do we not live in a society where we're innocent till proven guilty? You know, the, you know, even if you look at Andrew Tate, it's interesting, he's got his brother Tristan Tate, who is a completely separate figure to him. And he was imprisoned as well. And the irony of, I can't even remember his name, Hugh, what's his name, the guy from the BBC who's been found with pedo pictures and that. And you, you, in the podcast I just watched, he said, my favorite clip of all time is that fella, can't remember his name, Hugh Jones or something. That fella on TV, on BBC saying that I am, you know, an immoral sexual trafficker person. He's just like, but you're the one who's now been done. And the whole, this is the mad thing, <laughs> that the whole elite system is run on sexual immorality. And so the best thing they can do is accuse somebody of this kind of thing because it stains their reputation, even if there is no legitimacy to the claims, even if there is no evidence to put them down is that just the accusation brings them down and turns a lot of people against them. So, must be a tough situation to take. Ultimately, in relation to Andrew Tate and Islam, you know, alhamdulillah, I was Islam. I was Muslim. I'd embraced Islam quite a while before Andrew Tate. Not this competition. <laughs> but I do think that certainly he lacks a little bit of meekness and humility and that is kind of part of modesty. That is, those are all great elements within Islam. And when you're still, ha when you're still showing a certain amount of bravado and multiple sexual partners outside of marriage, certainly Islam does not teach this. But at the same time, again, I think that you have to see that obviously believing in God is the most obvious thing that anybody can do. But yeah, the wool is being pulled over so many people's eyes. And then, you know, the greatest trick of the devil is for people to believe he does not exist. But when you actually just look at the world, you can suddenly very quickly come to realize that how can you not believe in evil? I think that the, the atheist folk with their subjective morality still have their fitra, their innate disposition towards the creator and towards the objective moral framework they still know deep down that there is a very clear difference between good and evil and that this is not something that we merely create in our own brains and something that differs from person to person you have a sense of revulsion you have a sense of justice with inside you so anyway perhaps i'll do another video today very soon really appreciate everybody listening quite nicely conclude the video as it gets to half an hour if you watch this far then subscribe to the channel really appreciate everybody always remember big up your good selves 
And until next time, good folk, Alvida Sane.